Hi, it's Greg Hurrell here and I'm back with another Vim screencast after a bit of an absence. And uh, tonight I wanted to address a request from a subscriber to uh, explain a little bit about how my dot files are organized. Uh, because in a lot of the other screencasts I link to the dot files and then people land in my repo and find that it's pretty complicated and not necessarily obvious how it's all structured. Um, and so I wanted to just spend some time explaining that. So before I actually look at the content of the repo here, uh, I just want to explain that I use Ansible to configure new machines and install dot files. And that's where a lot of the complexity comes from. Uh, if you haven't heard of Ansible, it is a system configuration management tool, kind of like Puffet or Chef or Salt. Um, the reason I choose Ansible is because it's simple compared to some of those client server architectures. The idea is that you run Ansible on one machine and then it connects to all of the machines that you want to configure. You don't have to set up a centralized server anywhere that will serve as the source of truth. You just need a repo or even not a repo, just a collection of files on your local machine. That's the source of truth. Um, and in the case of configuring a laptop, you're not actually connecting to remote machines. You can just run Ansible on itself, on the, on the machine that you're actually running on. Um, it's pretty straightforward, um, mostly configured using YAML files. And uh, I have used Puppet and Chef, and this is by far the, the simplest and most painless way I've found to configure machines. So if you want to learn more about Ansible, I think you can go here. There's a link to the Ansible docs. Um, and after several clicks, you actually get through the real docs, um, which lists how to use this thing um, and all of the modules that it has. Uh, which allow, enable you to set machines up. Um, there are literally hundreds of these things. Um, but I'll show you some basics um, in terms of how I use this in my dot files. So most Ansible uh, configuration setups are split up into roles. So when you look at my dot files repo, there are no dot files here. <laughs> and that's because dot files are actually just one of many things that get set up. They're just one of these roles. Um, so under roles, dot files, this is where the dot file configuration actually happens. Um, if you look at tasks, this shows the steps that will be executed when I want to set up a machine. Basically, this says make sure that some directories exist, set up some sing links, check if there are any pre-existing files on the, on the machine. If there are pre-existing files, back them up. Then create sim links so that in the home directory where the dot file would normally reside, you just have a sim link that actually points into the repo. Um, so I'll run the install script, the sim links will get set up. From that point on, I can actually just edit the dot files in the repo and do commits. I don't have to rerun the install because the sim links are always pointing to the latest version. Um, but if I wanted to, I could rerun the install. Um, let me skip some of the details there and go back to the dot files thing here. Most of the dot files themselves are in this files directory. Um, so you can see, for example, dot vim is a directory in here. And in the end, all of this stuff is just normal files. And I will wind up with a sim link to the dot vim directory. It's not that everything inside the dot vim directory ends up getting sim links. So if I look at my, uh, my home directory, um, I'm not in my home directory. Uh, you can see here that, oops, sorry, I'm embarrassing myself here. Yeah, vim here is just a sim link to dot vim in my dot files repo. Uh, on the subject of vim, I keep my plugins all in this git repo. I don't use a plugin manager because since vim 8 and neovim, vim already has adequate plugin or package management functionality. So I just, that is not where I meant to go. I meant to go to bundle, I think, oh, no, pack, yeah. Um, so under here, I have a bunch of uh, Git submodules. So when I want to install a new machine, I do a recursive clone of this repo, ends up pulling down all of the uh, versions of these Vim plugins as Git repos. Uh, and I let Vim do the work of loading these things. Don't use any third-party plugin manager. 
In addition to all these dot files themselves, which are basically just static files, um, I have some templates um, and you can see them here. So if you look at the volume of templates I have, it's much smaller than the volume of files that I have. Um, and that is because my preference is to use the exact same configuration file on every machine that I run. And if I need different behavior on different machines, I prefer to have some kind of conditional logic in the configuration file uh, so that I can just put it anywhere and know that it will work without me having to actually run Ansible. Um, but there are some cases where the configuration file is not expressive enough to you know, permit conditional logic and I have no choice but to use a template and create a different version of the file on each machine. So here's an example. I guess this one will be relatively small. Uh, this is related to mail sending. What will happen when I run my Ansible install process is that it will substitute some variables in here depending on what machine I'm on. Um, and the main use case here is I've got a personal machine and a work machine. I only want personal email accounts set up on my personal machine and work email account on the work machine. So these end up just being variables that are pulled in specific to each machine. Um, and as I said, there aren't many of these. They're most, a lot of them are related to mail. Uh, almost all of them are related to mail and there's just a few that aren't. And the vast bulk of things are just normal static files, like I said. And so an example of a way that you can make the same file work in multiple places, uh, looking at Vim is probably a good, good place to start. If we look at the VimRC here, uh, There'll be a few conditionals in here um, such that no matter what version of Vim I'm running on, this should at least degrade gracefully. Um, and so basically this line here is a bit of feature detection. If we have packages, then it means we're running on like Vim 8 or NeoVim. And we're going to load all those packages, all of those plugins. Otherwise, we're going to fall back to Pathogen, which is what I used to use uh, before Vim 8 came out. And so if you were to look through all of my Vim files, you'd see there's a bunch of places where I do these if checks to see if Vim has a particular feature. And if it has it, I use it. If it doesn't, I try to degrade gracefully or use an alternative. Um, another way to use uh, machine specific settings, you can see here, um, where it basically checks to see if there's a vimrc.local file present on any given machine. And if it is, it'll source it. Um, and likewise, I can, I also have this thing here, which enables me to add files that are specific to a particular host name. Um, in this case, uh, at work, I've got a bunch of dev machines that all have the same kind of host name. So if the host name of the machine I'm running on happens to match one of these patterns, then we're going to use this extra file that I've created that pulls in like work related config. Uh, and I think I, yeah, here's another one again. Um, this just looks for a specific host name. So just say I had a machine called foo. This would, uh, on the foo machine, pull in .vim slash host slash foo um, if it existed. Um, and so in this way, I can commit, if I want, uh, specific files for specific hosts. Now at the moment, the only host specific file I've got in here is that dev star one, which handles all of my dev machines. But in the past I've had, you know, specific host names in here. And I do a similar thing with zish config, uh, if I remember correctly. This is going to make for the word specific, yeah. Same deal, um, if I'm on a dev machine, we're gonna look for this dev star thing. Otherwise, we're gonna look for a host specific file at zish slash host slash the host name. And if I've got just a generic ZSHRC local on the machine, then we're gonna require that as well. So in these ways, I can pull in specific config for ZSH2. Um, but in general, I still prefer, if I can, to just do feature detection and have like one file that works everywhere. So that basically describes how the dot files work. Um, some of these other roles, I guess I should talk about how the roles work overall you can some sometimes the name will reveal what it does um, but each of them has a, a description file in it as well which says what the thing does um, some of these things shouldn't run everywhere uh, and so i have in the top level of the repo a couple of different yaml files that basically describe the different roles that should apply in different circumstances so if i'm in a darwin machine which basically means mac os 
then these are the roles that are going to be executed um, and in this order that you can see here. Um, and each of the roles also has a tag, which is what enables me to say, set up this Darwin machine, but only do one of these, because you can say only do jobs, uh, only, only execute roles that have, or tasks that have these tags in them. Um, in addition to the list of roles that are going to be played on a particular type of machine, I can also set overrides to variables here. Um, so I'll just contrast this with another file here, which is for the Linux machines that I run on. You see I do much less configuration on Linux machines. I just set up the dot files, which we've just been looking at. Also run this Vim role um, and a couple of different variables there on Linux built extensions end up having a different uh, file extension, so I need a different variable there. And uh, let's look into this Vim role, which might otherwise be confusing. Uh, so the Vim role has nothing to do with Vim.files. It has everything to do with all of the other stuff that you have to do to set up Vim. Let's see if the description is accurate. Yeah, it says updates the Vim bundle and compiles. It's probably not the best description. Uh, but if we actually look at the tasks that this thing is going to do, the main one, main.yaml is the kind of entry point. Um, you'll see here that it will conditionally do uh, include import tasks from other files. So when this variable is set, it's going to update the bundle, which basically means it's going to pull the latest changes in all of those Vim plugin submodules. Um, so this will happen when I run it uh, on a Darwin machine, but it's not going to run it when I do it on my work Linux machine. Uh, build is going to build some stuff, which I can look at in a bit. Uh, masochist is my website, which I only manage from my laptop. So this variable is only true on my personal laptop. Um, NeoVim just happens unconditionally. Um, and Deoplete happens when a variable is set. So let's look at what each of those do, or maybe not all of them, but uh, Bundle, what does Bundle do? Uh, Bundle runs a shell script, which basically does what I said, pulling all the, sub, uh, the Git modules down. Um, and it installs like a Python module that I use. If I recall correctly, I don't know if Vint is a linter or a tester, but for whatever reason, I have it in there. Um, NeoVim, what does that do? That installs some NeoVim dependencies, which includes uh, the NeoVim gem, which enables me to use like native Ruby powered Vim extensions like Command T. Um, and then likewise for Python 2 and Python 3 that enable me to use Python extensions like Altisnips, for example. Uh, Masochist, as I said, is my website. I have some custom plugins that do things like auto completion of wiki links when I'm editing markdown files for my website. Uh, and so pulling those dependencies there, not relevant to probably anyone else in the universe except me. Uh, Deoplete as well has some dependencies, uh, basically just pulls those down, creates some uh, directories that are required and moves things into place. And have we looked at all of them? This build is the only one I think we haven't looked at. Basically sets up command T. Um, and this one other task, which is setting up the spell file. Uh, but basically, as you can see here, Ansible enables you to pretty much arbitrarily run shell scripts and just do stuff. Um, and that's what the Vim role is doing. Uh, in terms of other roles that are kind of relevant to things that I've shown in my dot files, I use a fair bit of software homebrew role sets up that. Um, it, basically, if you look in here, we've got the template with a brew file, which lists all the packages that I want to use. Um, and because this is a template, there is some uh, conditional things in here that control which packages get installed on which machines, whether they be personal or work machines. Uh, another interesting role, I think, for people who are looking at dot files, uh, don't know if there is actually anything that interesting here, to be honest. Defaults sets up Mac OS X defaults. So if we look at those, you can see big long list. Actually, it's not that big at all, is it? That's not very interesting to look at. Let's look at tasks. This is where all the interesting content is. Basically just sets up a bunch of preferences in plist files on Mac OS. So that's another potentially interesting role. Um, term info, useful for setting up 256 color support and whatnot for Tmux, because I th think the term info database is not totally up to date on macOS or Linux for that matter. Um, I think those are the, the major things of interest here. Um, and so 
just by way of closing this out, uh, I'll give you a demo of how this actually works when you run it. Um, it might not work for you. Um, and sometimes I get issues on this saying like I tried your thing and it doesn't work on my machine. It, it really is because it's it's for me, right? <laughs> um, it's not intended to be like dot files for the masses, but uh, I do think it's at least worth explaining how this is structured um, in case you ever want to do something like this yourself. But basically install is just a simple bash script that sets up Ansible and provides a convenient interface for invoking Ansible. Ultimately what is going to do the real work is one of these uh, Ansible playbook invocations down here where it's gonna ask me for my pseudo password. Uh, it's going to potentially pass some extra args that I've passed through, which is what enables me to focus the run based on tags. Uh, so let's try it. Let's see what it does when I when I run it. I guess we can get rid of that, we don't need that. Um, so if I just run install help, it is going to show me all of the roles which I can run. Uh, and the help here is really just those description files. Um, and some hints here for what I can do to change the behavior during the run. Um, so if ever anything breaks, what I'll usually want to do is pass the step parameter, which basically requires me to confirm each step so that I can really see the run as it goes. And also start at task where I can basically just say something blew up on like task 53 out of 100. I can start at task 53 having made a change and see if it's working. Uh, so let us run the dot files uh, uh, task. So we're gonna run install dot files. Um, and we should see that it doesn't do a hell of a lot to be honest. And you can see my password. That's just ridiculous. <sighs> anyway. All those things that say OK means that Ansible checked if it should do something and figured there was nothing to do. Didn't actually have to make any changes. Those ones where it says change mean it decided it would make a change and I wonder what they are, to be honest. It's possible that I had a local edit to some of those files. Or rather, okay, I know what that is. Every time I run the, well, it, it, since I last run this, the, the template must have updated, which means we created a backup copy of these things that were templates. And then when we, uh, got down to the templating stage it actually created the new versions of the templates. Um, and if we look at them, you'll see that they are indeed templated out. Um, you can see it says Ansible manage, do not edit, see the template source. That itself is substituted. Uh, and then some other stuff in here I actually don't know. I guess, yeah, this is the stuff that would have been, these, these would have been variables. Um, so I'm, I'm on my personal machine right now, so it shows my personal email address there. Uh, and that is, uh, very similar to the work version is, but uh, these values for like server and whatnot are different on the work version of this template. So that is how it all works. Um, so I hope that's been helpful uh, to anybody who is trawling through my dot files. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that anybody set something up like this themselves unless they really enjoy tinkering. Uh, but for me, it's been fun over the years to basically control as much as I can in an automated reproducible way. Um, and Ansible is a large part of that. So thanks for your time. And uh, I imagine that my next screencast will be more Vim focused than this. Uh, but I, if you want to be notified, notified of when that comes out, just subscribe and you'll find out. <laughs>